Well, welcome to the show. I'm Ryan McNeese, and we're here at Gonzaga Law School doing the Scholar Series. We're here with our guest, Jason Gilmer. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. A couple points we want to start out with is uh, Professor Gilmer is the inaugural holder of the John J. Hemmingson Chair in Civil Liberties, also the director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights. Started your academic career as a fellow at Stanford Law School. That's right. LLM at Harvard Law School. That's right. Uh, and a major fundamental of this series is uh, the intent of really looking at the depth and plethora of scholarship uh, here within Gonzaga Law School mm -hmm. uh, and within our community. And uh, you yourself have written over 25 publications as well as done uh, upwards of 25 presentations. Uh, the area of passion and interest appears to be uh, Antebellum South, Civil mm -hmm. Liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about how that passion became yours. And well, I think, um, I, you know, I got into legal history um, when I was in college, actually. Um, I was a history major. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, I thought about going to get a PhD in history, but was told by my pre-law advisor that there are no jobs in history. So I think everybody consistently is told. <laughs> right. So why not go to law school? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I used my opportunity in law school really to pursue that passion of um, looking at history, looking at uh, social justice issues. And it's been something that's been with me since I, since I started my career. Well, and it's pretty evident through the plethora of, of uh, publications that we discussed. And recently, uh, you had a book launch for your new book, uh, Slavery and Freedom in Texas, Stories from the Courtroom, 1821 to 1871. If we could, I'd like to have you expand on uh, some of the respective stories. This book is broken up into what I would call courtroom drama and uh, and and you digging into the depths of uh, courtroom records to unearth how, uh, how the psychology and law and social issues and race issues of the time. If you could expand on a couple of the stories that really sure. uh, play out. Yeah, well you're right, this is, a, um, this is a narrative history and in the book I explore um, in depth five different mm -hmm. trials. Um, trials that took place in antebellum Texas that involved in one way or another a question of slavery, of freedom, of race, of class, of gender. And um, so it's, it's, um, it unfolds, these stories unfold as if they were um, sort of happening before you. So it's not really a book in which I'm maybe following a traditional ap approach where I discuss facts and discuss holdings and so forth, it's really just an opportunity to read a story. Because these were, after mm -hmm. all, I mean, these are trials. And as right. you know, as a trial lawyer, trials are very much about mm -hmm. storytelling. And so I stay true to that form, um, digging into some of these cases. Uh, Jason, I would actually say that's very true. I think the, the stories and the parables that you've weaved uh, through these uh, specific chapters lay it out like you'd be laying it out to a jury, yeah. trying to understand why each of the respective positions matters right. uh, within the story, matters uh, with regards to the outcome. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us how some of the, really the juxtapositions that were occurring between uh, Caucasian lawyers essentially mm -hmm. representing mm -hmm. slaves, mm -hmm. but in the South during this time period, in Texas specifically, right. those were some real challenges that potentially lawyers would understand today in a, in a different environment, mm -hmm. different names and or social issues, but same psychology. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's right. So with, with these trials and recreating these narratives, mm -hmm. part of the project was to get to know the people. Um, and so I'm digging into their, their own personal histories, looking at census records, looking at tax records, looking at diaries, looking at newspaper accounts. And as you begin to learn a little bit about who these people were, you get to appreciate, I think, the relationships that they developed with one another. So if you're looking down from 30,000 feet, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense, really, that a lawyer from, say, Galveston, Texas, would take on a case in which a woman of color seeks mm -hmm. to be free. Um, it doesn't fit with the ideology. It doesn't fit with um, our understanding of the time. 
But if you dig, if you dig down deep and you kind of get to know these people and you understand that, well, they actually lived near one another. Mm -hmm. um, this woman's uh, purported owner was an associate with this attorney. Um, and so they no doubt saw each other on a daily basis. Well, I think, I think the case you're referencing is you have a slave owner mm -hmm. uh, that essentially, uh, and I think is described in the book, is not so much a story about his life, but rather a story that develops after his death, right. that uh, through his will, he intends to free his slave and right. grant assets through his probate to the slave, right. which raises the questions of yeah. uh, uh, the representation as well as is this lawful within Texas? Yeah, exactly. Because you know Texas was a, um, um, of course, it, it entered the Union in 1845. Uh, it was a republic from 1835 to 1845, and before that, it was part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, Texas has a very interesting history. But part of that history is Southerners coming and bringing their ideologies and their laws. Uh, into uh, the state or into the region. Um, so it's very much of a pro-slavery mm -hmm. institution, but um, within that, um, within that, I think there was a lot of room for people to get to know one another, a lot of room for uh, these relationships to develop. And this particular case, as you mentioned, involved a slaveholder who, who attempted to free his slave in his will, and he was a very, very wealthy man. Um, and it was challenged, right? Somebody well, and it was part of the establishment within the norms of yeah. that uh, community. It was challenged, and, and um, the laws actually would not have really necessarily allowed for this to take place because Texans tried to get rid of all the free people of color. Um, and so she needed a really good lawyer who was going to be able to represent her um, in her pursuit of freedom. And with it, um, a pursuit of an estate in the city of Galveston, which was quite substantial. Well, and you'd, you'd indicated an interesting concept, too, in terms of the early history of Texas, mm -hmm. where you had uh, essentially Mexico was anti-slavery. Right. How did that play into some of your writings and research? Yeah, so that's kind of an interesting part of Texas history that's um, not always um, at the forefront, mm -hmm. right? When you think about kids going through grade school and, and into high school, a lot of what they hear about the relationship with Mexico is the Alamo, right? Mm -hmm. The Battle of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we don't really think about is the battle for, the, uh, for Texas independence was at least in part because the Anglo-American settlers uh, wanted slavery and Mexico did not want slavery. Mexico had its own history when it um, uh, threw off the shackles of bondage when it had a revolution against Spain. Um, and so it was familiar with these concepts of freedom. Um, and it did not want um, Anglo-Americans to be bringing in the institution of slavery into the Mexican territory. So um, uh, I think that, uh, I, I think that you know, they passed laws, they passed uh, restrictions on slavery, and um, it really was through the political will of people like Stephen F. Austin mm -hmm. and other Anglo-American leaders that um, created opportunities for slavery, and indeed they fought for slavery. And you probably were seeing this as you were pouring over the uh, records and documents within these respective courthouses sure. during your travels of sure. writing and research yeah. to see how the political intersection of some of the statutory and legislative uh, combined with the daily reality of courtroom drama. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you can take a look at the Supreme Court cases, you can look at the legislative records from the, from, uh, the Texas Congress, and you can see it following a particular path, you know, a path towards slavery. And then you have these pockets of cases that I speak about in the book where um, I don't know that they're interrupting that path, but they're certainly creating some interesting contradictions. Well, and bringing light to important mm -hmm. issues on the chronological uh, historical timeline. Right. Uh, another uh, case that I think stands out to me within the book uh, was the Charles Brady sure. uh, uh, case, where in East Texas, as a slave, uh, uh, Charles Brady as a slave overseer had shot Miles, a slave. Right. But then the slave owner did not 
pay the slave overseer. And there again, uh, you have some real issues where uh, the benevolent institution versus an immoral institution of slavery. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that. So that's a really interesting case. And I think of the five um, uh, trials that I mm -hmm. write about, each of them involves some schism in the social order. Um, some, some opportunity in which issues of race and class and uh, uh, slavery and freedom come into play. And this is a good example of that. As you mentioned, you have a, an overseer who's in charge of 35 mm -hmm. enslaved men and women. And you know, keep in mind, overseers were, um, it was a, that would have been a very difficult job. Um, you're trying to um, uh, coax labor out of people who, who have absolutely no interest. Yeah, no in, choice in that. <laughs> yeah, in, in doing this. And um, so overseers were, were considered, you know, of a different class. Hmm. Um, a different class of persons. And this, and this, but he's got the responsibility of keeping order. So he shoots one of the slaves. To keep that potential order. To keep that order. He shoots one of these slaves in the, in the back. And, um, Which you would think the slave owner, it would be in the slave owner's best interest or some idea of that. Yeah, exactly. But, but here's the thing, right, is now the owner um, looks at this enslaved man who she counts as her property, mm -hmm. and her property has now been damaged to the point where her property is not able to perform mm -hmm. the services that she um, uh, expected from him. Mm -hmm. So what does she do? She fires the overseer. And now the overseer feels that, hey, this wasn't fair. Um, I'm going to sue you for my lost wages. And so now we have a racial conflict that sort of is manifesting itself in the form of class. You have a, a poor overseer um, against a wealthy owner. And it's interesting the dynamics that come into play. Well, the immense psychology and <clears throat> self-interest uh, social dynamic, as you indicated, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I think. In in this uh, in this book that just launched, uh, is the intersection of so many of these mm -hmm. issues. Uh, uh, legal issues are never, as you're describing, never a standalone mm -hmm. uh, in a vacuum type scenario. It's it's the social fabric of the communities and psychology of what's going on during those time periods. Yeah. What what's the methodology that uh, over the many years, decade in which mm -hmm. you researched and wrote this book? What is the methodology that you used in researching and writing this book? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, uh, this was really an effort to uncover very local histories, mm -hmm. right? Local stories, and. In order to get to know the people, you really have to journey down to these uh, locations in order to really discover uh, who these people mm -hmm. were and what the environment was like. It's and how they related, you've mentioned this, how they related to each other. Mm -hmm. what, what was the uh, intersection, as you've described, the intersection between the attorney that's taking the case mm -hmm. and uh, the landowner or slave owner mm -hmm. and how that actually plays into it. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's, it's about getting to know these people and, and what their situation was, where they lived. Um, and so it was, it was a really interesting opportunity for me just to understand more about the local history. How many towns and uh, communities do you think you visited and how many courthouses, oh, the depths of the courthouses? Yeah, boy, I don't know, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, between the courthouses and the local museums and those sorts of things, we're probably, I'm probably looking at, you know, 20 or 25 different uh, places that, that, where these documents were held. And I would wager the story within the story, I understand uh -huh. your wife and yourself traveled quite a bit together yeah. to these respective areas and yeah. did some joint research. So yeah. that story in, it, in itself, the behind the scenes, yeah. uh, is equally fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and I, I definitely want to be able to have an opportunity to chat about uh, some of the extremely important things uh, you're doing here at Gonzaga Law. Uh, again, we're, we're certainly highlighting uh, numerous publications as well as presentations in the area of mm -hmm. civil rights. But, but specifically with civil rights, uh, you are starting and opening the Civil and Human Rights Center. 
Correct. Uh, that is something new to Gonzaga and significant for the area and significant in the country. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, that launch and what your goals and yeah. opportunities are? So we created this, the Center for Civil and Human Rights um, at the beginning of last year. Um, so it's a new program or a new center, but it's, all, it's something that really ties into the long tradition of Gonzaga mm -hmm. University. As you know, the Jesuit tradition of educating the whole person to serve the public good is, is really um, who we are as a university and as an institution. So the center is really an opportunity for us to capitalize on that mission, um, to bring into um, a coherent program um, all the good work that faculty are doing, mm -hmm. that staff are doing, and that students are doing, and pr just provide the framework for that, the intellectual right. framework, if you will, for all yeah. that interesting work. Well, and I'd, I would obviously compliments to yourself and your colleagues uh, sitting at this table. We've discussed uh, uh, that framework and the uh, scholarly work that is being done that then gives the students uh, the opportunity to take that forth into the community. Yeah. What, what are your ideas with the center to engage not only the faculty and uh, resources here at the law school, but to engage the community yeah. uh, to bring light to civil rights issues? Right, so you know, there, there are three, there are sort of three main components to the center. Um, three pillars of excellence. One is a research pillar, one is an um, education pillar, and then the other is the community engagement pillar. Because that enge community engagement pillar, mm -hmm. as you're talking about, is really, um, in many respects, some of the most important mm -hmm. work that we do. Because this isn't, is, it isn't just an intellectual exercise. These are real right. people with real problems, and we're uh, um, doing our best to help them um, solve those problems. Um, and so through community engagement, you know, some of the um, preliminary things we have been, been doing is, well, holding a conference or right. holding a citizenship day clinic, um, those types of things. Bringing the community in to get an idea of yeah. what those issues are. Yeah. But we're also hoping that we'll be able to expand the mm -hmm. center as we, as we grow. Um, and perhaps provide additional clinic opportunities for our students who will then be able to help the underserved in our community. Uh, we hope too to be involved not just in direct representation but also the indirect policy making. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's, a, that's an ambitious goal, it's a future goal, but at some point we want to be you know at the table when we're debating yeah. new laws and well, I think it's a, it's actually uh, it's a realistic goal because I think as you're describing with the different fundamentals and pillars uh, of the Center for uh, Civil and Human Rights is you have the the faculty that within these walls is doing the scholarly work, yeah. but you are having the opportunities uh, to speak to the future lawmakers, yeah. private, governmental, nonprofit legislators. Right. That's where hopefully that yeah. epicenter expands and, and you yourself obviously are teaching you teach con law torts uh, civil, civil rights, rights yeah. so uh, it appears the very fabric of what yeah. you're talking about is you're having that opportunity yeah. uh, and, and students too I mean that's I think that's what you're getting at mm -hmm. is the idea that you know that second pillar of education right. is really about educating the next generation of social justice lawyers so it's classroom mm -hmm. um, um, opportunities, but it's bigger than that, right? We're really trying to um, give the students uh, opportunities to think about how they might help the, uh, the underserved, mm -hmm. the poor, and the vulnerable. You know, we've created opportunities, for example, um, where we're, we're, we're fortunate to be able to fund mm -hmm. um, or provide scholarships for some students to pursue some of these activities. So we had one student last summer who was down on the border of Arizona and Mexico working with undocumented children. We had another one, because we have a, a global reach, not just mm -hmm. a domestic reach, we had another one who was over in Afghanistan um, helping to set up rule of law um, or addressing rule of law issues in Afghanistan. And we also were able to send eight students to the International Criminal Court right. in The Hague as part of our um, 
uh, Florence program and our global engagement. So we're really hoping to give students these opportunities. Classroom, yes, but outside the classroom as well. I think you're illustrating that very well, that uh, those opportunities are starting here on the Gonzaga campus, bringing in the diversity of students from all over the country and yeah. internationally. But Gonzaga is providing that core opportunity that then, in my opinion, uh, the lawyer or otherwise needs to take that opportunity and, and go forth, right. whether it be locally, whether it be uh, regionally, nationally, internationally, those opportunities are there, uh, but there's a certain amount of uh, responsibility on each attorney, and like I said, yeah. or otherwise, yeah. to make those choices to go serve the community. Right, and you know, we've, we're actually seeing um, a, a sort of renewed interest, if mm -hmm. you will, from uh, students um, coming to law school or, or expressing interest in coming to law school to uh, engage in these types of um, uh, pursuits. So we always have room at Gonzaga for um, all students who might not be interested in this. You know, as you know, we have a great intellectual pro property mm -hmm. program. We have a great commercial law center. We've got other opportunities that are certainly available for students. But we are hopefully creating a, a, a substantial space for those students who are interested in social justice issues. Well, as you said, educating the full person. Right. Whether you're solely or you think you're solely interested in business or intellectual property or family law or what have you, right. uh, Gonzaga is educating the full person right. uh, to engage within the community. Yeah. Uh, how does understanding of the themes that we're talking about, whether it's with the Civil and Human Rights Center, uh, through your classroom opportunities, through your presentations, your publications, this book, uh, how does this better uh, our search for racial equality? Boy, that's, that's a big question. That's a big question. How much time do we have? Yeah, as um, much as you want. Um, you, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, the the arc of history mm -hmm. and you know um, Martin Luther King of course famously said that the arc of history bends towards justice and I, th I think that's true but it takes a lot of work for us to get there we have to be constantly fighting um, for that to happen and we're gonna have setbacks I mean I think that's mm -hmm. just the way um, uh, this this business works um, two steps forward, one, one step backwards. Well, you, so not a straight line. It's not a straight line. Um, and so I think there are lessons though. I mean, one of the reasons I do legal history is because I think it does inform mm -hmm. who, where we are right now at the present. And I deal a lot with racial issues in this book. I deal a lot with racial issues in other areas. Um, but I think that there are some lessons that we can learn even from, as we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the relationship between the lawyer and the woman who sought to be free. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, maybe it's idealistic right now to think that people will step outside of their echo chambers uh, and cable news and, and mm -hmm. their Facebook posts um, and take a moment to get to know somebody who's different from them, mm -hmm. they are. But, but that's really how we're gonna move forward, right? Is, is to get to know those people who are different from us in our communities, recognize mm -hmm. the common humanity and move forward. But what, what was striking to me, not only today in our conversation, but at, at your book launch, is this concept of fleshing out these ideas, these ideals uh, between the attorneys uh, of this era and why they were or weren't taking cases or why they should or shouldn't take cases. Uh -huh. <clears throat> that struck me at the book launch because I don't think that's any different than today. Yeah. Again, you might change the name or phrases of this issue or that issue, mm -hmm. but it still, as you said, holds true as examples yeah. in everyday practical uh, legal practice right. as to the question why. Right. Why are you taking this right. case? Why should you take this case? And what is trying to be accomplished with this right. case? I mean, I admire greatly my, my criminal law colleagues, uh, those who uh, in particular do the defense work, mm -hmm. because, you know, you're dealing with people who, you know, who are accused, at least, of committing some very serious mm -hmm. affronts to our society. And to go into the courtroom every day and represent them to the fullest is, I think, an admirable quality. 
And you know what? If you talk to those people, and I'm, I'm sure you can mm -hmm. back, back me up on this, these become real people, right? Mm -hmm. They're not just the accused. They're not just a defendant. This is a real person with a real life story. Yep, real, a real background yeah. that led to the events that you're right. discussing. Right, and I think that's, that's, that's about who we are mm -hmm. at the law school is really, you know, um, helping people to understand and appreciate. And challenge their own thinking. Exactly. What are some of the projects uh, that you have going right now? Uh, you have a long history of uh, scholarship. Uh, yeah. What entices you next? What, what's, what you I have a lot on your plate I, as well, it is. Well, I think a couple of things, if I can. I mean, the Center for Civil and Human Rights is really um, uh, at the forefront right now. It's, it's really all-encompassing mm -hmm. in many respects. And one of the exciting opportunities that we're having uh, is our center launch, which will take place on Friday, September 28th. Okay. with an all-day conference, and we're bringing in experts from around the country um, to speak about issues of civil and human rights. And so we're really excited about that. It's um, uh, really looking forward to it. The other project, though, outside of the center is, as you know, I'm a committed scholar and researcher, mm -hmm. and so I have um, a project that I'm working on right now that actually comes out of California and the gold rush era, hmm. 1848, 1849. Um, and it ties into my previous work. Yeah, I was gonna work. say, in terms of the timeline, yeah. you're right in the middle there. But it, what it involves is, is people who are coming out to California to strike it rich. But keep in mind, it wasn't just, um, well, I don't know, people from New York or Connecticut, it was also people from Mississippi and mm -hmm. Alabama. And often the people from Mississippi and Alabama would, would come to California with um, two or three enslaved uh, uh, persons to help in the gold mines. Well, California enters the Union as a free state, but you have all these slaves mm -hmm. in California. So you know as well as I do, it's gonna result in litigation, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna try and figure out, okay, are these people slave? Are they free? What does the new constitution mean? And so I'm digging around on a case that made it up to the California Supreme Court in which these issues were at play. Well, I'll certainly second the fact that you've illustrated how relevant research in history and the examples and stories and documentation is extremely relevant today for practicing lawyers, students, uh, and creating that engagement in, in our community. And I think it's noteworthy that when you look at the breadth of your presentations, uh, it's not isolated in any respect to the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. or any particular region. You've, you've presented all over the country. Right. And to me, that goes to that engagement that uh, mm -hmm. not only yourself and your passion, but Gonzaga Law is trying to engage with our country mm -hmm. and internationally right. to bring these issues to the forefront, yeah. and again, to educate the whole person. Yeah. Uh, I thank you very much for your time and, and appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, another episode of the Scholar Series here at Gonzaga Law with Professor Jason Gilmer. Thank you. Thanks very much.